Tanse, Kia Maga. Um, I'm Loretta Todd, and welcome to another amazing IM4 webinar. We are going to start with our protocols with um, Sanakwa Weiss giving a land acknowledgement, which will be followed by Drum Beat Productions doing some cool beats. And then we'll be coming back to the um, webinar and uh, listening to some amazing, brilliant artists. Thank you. Hi, hi. Hot squail, euch tenoya. Sanakula, qui ansna, tenachinfa aslahan, uchameo, e wanaox titameo, plas kahotmish ost almo, e taslewit ath mastimo, e komathquiam mastimo, an wanaox titameo. Hot squail, shquen qui ansna, tenachinfa slewat uchameo. My name is Sanakula, and my family comes from the Squamish village site called Eslahan. Yay, my name is Ocean, and I come from the people of Slowtooth, the people of the inlet, and I carry the ancestral name Tsimtalat. Hey everybody, what's up? It's me, Miss Christy Lee, and I come from this place called Malé, where we are sitting today at the mouth of the river. This is the home of my ancestors, the home of my children, and the home of our future generation. These are the shared village sites and lands and waters of, I was saying in translation, of the Squamish people, the Tsleil-Waututh people, and the Musqueam people. I think I am four and Vif in this collaboration of these storytellers. Um, I thank them for reaching out and acknowledging the, the people of Slotuth, the people of Musqueam, and the people of Squamish um, to move forward with their work in a good way to acknowledge these people of, of the land that they're working on and collaborating in that way and um, acknowledging the storytellers of this land to move forward with their storytelling work. And so I'd like to say chin kumintomi and tamata kwetsi kuyan snechim. I just wanted to give a great big haichka, haitsepka, haitsepka to all the matriarchs, all the filmmakers, the cinematographers, the editors, the sound people, um, everybody who's holding it down at the IM4 Labs. Much love to all the work that you do, much success and blessings for this virtual celebration that you're holding. Haitsepka, haitsepka nasiyam nasiyaya. Respect.
Oh, that was so, um, we're so grateful. Um, that was an awful we also, um, Miss Christy, uh, Christy Lee Charles and Ocean Highland. Those young women are amazing artists in their own right. Um, and it's a big thank you and hands up in, in their tradition for um, all the good work they do in the community um, and for um, um, being part of I'm for acknowledging um, and welcoming us really to their land because we are so fortunate to be on their land. So hi, hi. Um, very quickly, um, before I start going into the webinar and then talking about um, the IM4 lab, um, I need to do some acknowledgements as well. Um, I wanted to thank all the amazing people who helped make um, the IM4 lab possible. Um, when I imagined the IM4 lab, uh, I saw it as a place of reciprocity and respect. So it was important for the governance structure to represent that. So I imagine a council of matriarchs, um, women who I felt um, have always shown a sense of, of uh, reciprocity toward um, the community um, and by bringing so much creativity and creating opportunity and space for others to also express their creativity. Um, so, you know, big props out to the people who really guide us and, and um, make sure that we are practicing in a good way. These include Cease Weiss, who's a media artist and an ethnobotanist and Tracy Kimbono, who's a broadcast journalist and also a media artist, and Dwayne Manuel, who's a filmmaker and beat artist, and all of them are educators and community activists and have made great change in, in, in the community and always giving back um, to artists and making space for, for new artists and emerging artists. And that ranges, for me, an emerging artist could be 10 years old and they can be 80 years old. Um, Next, I'd like to put a big uh, shout out to our team that also works really hard um, every day um, on I'm4, and that's Colin Van Loon, the operations manager and project coordinator, Alana Mandaman and Shawanda, who has been doing a lot of the groundwork to make these webinars happen, and Colin, who's you know um, always making sure that we're moving forward and moving forward in a good way, and our social media with Savannah Todd, who. Um, is an artist as well in her own right, as, as is uh, Colin and, and Alana, they're both filmmakers. And uh, a while back, we were very um, lucky to have um, uh, Sasha, who was also part of our team, who um, uh, while, um, while Alana was on mat leave, I say that uh, she has I am for a baby. <laughs> um, and then of course, uh, Emily Carr, especially President Dr. Jillian Seidel, the Vice President of Research, Dr. Stephen Lamb, who has been a great advocate for us, and our administration genius, Leanne Rooney, who helps make all these various funding sources work together. Um, plus the people at the BIF um, immersed, this it takes our projects to another level. And so we really appreciate uh, Ken Che for all the work he's done and Ken Clem Lebeau, the techie artist who, who helps make all these webinars look so slick. And I also have to thank all our funders, um, Western Diversification, Congress of Aboriginal People, Creative BC, Canada Council, um, the Discovery Foundation, Emily Carr, Center for Digital Media, and I'm sure I left someone out, but it's been very, uh, we've gotten a lot of support from the community um, as we move forward with IM4. Um, I just wanna say a little bit about myself. Um, I don't know if everybody knows you know who I am. Um, I created the I am four lab about two and a half, three years ago. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I did that, but prim I am primarily an, a filmmaker um, and a producer. I create um, television series um, a lot for children. I did Nihuaitan, which is a, a series that teaches young kids to speak free that was on APTN. And I've been doing a series called Coyote's Crazy Smart Science Show, which is about Indigenous science and we actually have had episodes about virtual reality and, you know, um, it's, it's been a great, a great series and it's on, on um, APTN on their SD channel, not their HD channel, um, but it's um, on Sunday mornings and also um, it's on GEM now and also on APTN Lumi. Um, so that's something that I do. Um, I also have been writing and in, in the past I wrote things like um, Aboriginal narratives in cyberspace, which I, some people tell me is was a rather seminal um, essay about some of these discussions we have around technology. 
um, and my feature film um, based on uh, Eden Robinson's book, Monkey Beach, will be coming out very soon. We're just finishing up the VFX. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm originally from, um, my family is Cree Métis, um, St. Paul the Métis, uh, Whitefish Lake First Nations, the uh, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, and also from the Red River Métis in Winnipeg. So that's a very, very quick um, bit about me and all the wonderful people who helped make this happen. And of course we have some new interns and um, I'll get their names at the end so we can thank them too. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about IM4 because one of the bases of IM4 is certainly trans it's knowledge transfer. It's always exchanging knowledge, it's always growing knowledge. And I wanted to kind of just pinpoint that really quickly. Indigenous pedagogy, and I hate that name, word pedagogy, but nonetheless, indigenous pedagogy asks the questions, how do we want to learn and what, why we want to learn and why we want to learn in that way. As indigenous people, the shapes of our knowledge systems embody sacred space, a space in which we face each other and practice respect, renewal and reciprocity. Indigenous education, learning, knowledge systems are based upon universal access to knowledge. Yes, there is specialized knowledge and apprentice learning to bring those with particular talent, but first and foremost, everyone is given the knowledge to live the good life or meal a pintaswin, I'm sorry, my Cree is, I'm a little nervous, um, the good life in, in Cree. Everyone was responsible to maintain balance and harmony and the greatest gift to the people was to be able to take care of yourself. And everyone was responsible for knowledge of the earth and the cosmos. Um, traditional education and indigenous communities value the equity between applied scholarship and emotional intelligence. Children, youth, adults, and our elders engage in a form of learning that was cooperative, collective, and conscientious. That's from Dr. Pamela Toulouse. So at the core of IM4 Lab is certainly this idea of education, of knowledge, and knowledge exchange. We've been doing workshops for the last two and a half years. We've been bringing, anybody can come to our workshops. We've been doing them hands-on, 360 introduction to unity um, for AR, our AR for artists. We've had amazing instructors, including um, Michael uh, Running Wolf and um, Vince McAllister and uh, Olivier, last name I've forgotten, and um, others that I will, I will remember uh, soon. Uh, Moni Gar, she's one of our amazing instructors as well. And um, so it's really been, it's experiential. It's about learning and doing. So people are making 360 videos when they come into the class, they're creating their AR, they're imagining virtual reality. We haven't had a lot of production money, um, but we certainly hope to have more in the future. And we have a lot of plans as we transition to more online learning to take our training beyond Vancouver in the classroom. And it was, you know, watch this space because this is phase one of that process, but we'll be doing more so that we can actually get hands-on training into the community. Um, the other thing I wanted to say that in creating the IM4 um, lab, um, we hold these um, certain values um, as best we can in our practice, and that includes um, truth, love, happiness, respect, humility, thankfulness, kinship relations, um, helping, reciprocity, and guiding oneself in unity. And those are some of the principles that um, as Cree people um, I try to live by. Um, and at the core of this is a universal free access to, 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 to learning. Um, like, you know, as I said before, it can be, we've had, we really literally have had students who are 12 and we've had, had grandparents, grandmothers, um, people who are coming, who are artists who are going to art school and people who have been you know, returning to learning maybe after 30, 40 years. We really believe in lifelong learning. There is no end to learning. Um, and that's really part of what we're doing here. So that's kind of gives you a little bit about, about, about um, Sign 4 Lab, but I just wanted a little bit conceptual before we go on. And I think one of the really exciting things about, about this technology is it helps us, it, it, we, we, yes, we have to do this because we want to participate in this industry. We want to grow the industry. We want to digitize it. We want to make it our own. We want it to serve 
our own community's needs. But it's also exciting because it's something we can do conceptually, something that we can do philosophically. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is how do we fit the dimensions of the universe into these finite spaces? And our, our people have been doing that for a long time. They've been creating these ceremonies and, and art and these experiences and, and, and societies and cultures really that is trying to take the, the dimensions of the universe and, and you know, make them so that we can live by them in, 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 in the spaces of this finite world that we, we, are, we are part of this physical world. Um, so, so that's kind of really exciting for me um, when I think about those ideas and I think about the ceremonies and the ways in which our people express that. So this is basically what I'm thinking we might do a little bit more today, talk a little bit about that. And I sort of devised some specific questions um, for these very brilliant women who have agreed to be here today with us. Um, and even though, um, you know, with COVID, people have changed their, you know, the kind of places they can go. And then, but these women are working all the time. <laughs> so I, we really value that they've made time for us. And I really appreciate that. So I'm going to give very quick um, bios and then I'm going to go to, to them and um, I will give them the first, um, let them talk about themselves and then I will get to the questions. So the, Nancy Lee is a Taiwanese born interdisciplinary media artist, curator, filmmaker and cultural producer. Nancy is a co-producer and co-founder uh, of The Current, a feminist electronic art symposium, an intersectional and multidisciplinary initiative featuring artistic and educational program, programming for and by women, non-binary artists and artists of color. She co-created Telepresence, a VR8 channel surround sound live performance with Western Front and Tidal Traces, a VR360 dance film with the National Film Board. Currently, Nancy is collaborating with Karen um, Bomber on the speculative sci-fi exhibition exploring 3D scanning, printing, XR, and live performance scheduled for 2021 at the Richmond Art Gallery. And um, um, Anila Anushak is the founder of Mixtape, a, a writer for Marvel Comics. Anushak can create, uh, co-created the character of Snow Guard, a teenage superhero from, and I, from uh, Nunavut. Most recently, Nyla wrote and directed her first feature called Slashback, an alien invasion horror about a group of teen girls from the Arctic. In 2019, Anushak was uh, named one of the top five to watch by Playback magazine. Working in mixed media allows Zyla to channel her passions for technology and genre storytelling among mediums that include interactive graphic novels, film, television, and synthetic experiences. Um, she currently lives in Toronto and sits on the board of directors for, of Ontario Creates and the Glenn Gould Foundation. Uh, in 2020, she was asked by the UN Women to represent Canada in discussing the future of emerging technologies in G7 countries. So brilliance, brilliance, so much brilliance with us today and surrounding us. Um, and so I will now um, turn it over to um, the person who's furthest away, Nyla and let her talk a little bit more about herself, what I've asked if they could just talk about how they came to be doing the work that they're doing. And, um, and then we'll turn it over to Nancy to do the same before we go into the questions. Sure, I mean, you did such a great job introducing me. I, don't, I feel like I don't have to anymore. It was very, um, kind of felt like I was on a TV show or something with it, just kind of focusing on me while you read my bio. Um, yeah, I kind of, I guess I'm a professional nerd. I, I make stuff. <laughs> um, films mostly is kind of my thing, but I also am uh, kind of obsessed with anything interactive. I kind of, I think of kind of horror movies as my first love and then interactivity, video games, VR, XR is kind of this newfound passion that kind of feels, has the same kind of feeling as, um, movie making did for me and yeah and then I also do comic books and that kind of thing as well but um my main kind of focus these days is movies 
There was a little question I had to go along with that, if you feel comfortable asking that. Um, yeah. What were some of the challenges and some of the, the help and some of the obstacles you, you've encountered along the way? Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> Where do we begin? I'm, I mean, I've had lots of um, help, I think, from the Indigenous community that's in Toronto um, with Imaginative being here. Uh, I've had a really just kind of just by proximity, um, great relationships with different kind of filmmakers in the city um, through that I've kind of met through different programs with Imaginative. I've gotten to work um, with um, through through a program with Imaginative in the Tiff Bell Lightbox. I produced a couple of different interactive projects, getting to work directly with um, just amazing filmmakers, Dennis Goulet, Jeff Barnaby, to develop. Um, who are, you know, 2D, traditionally 2D filmmakers, but um, I got to help them make their first interactive projects. Um, yeah, so it, it uh, I think for me, the biggest um, kind of benefit I've had is really kind of exposure to these amazing Indigenous filmmakers around me. Um, and I've also, I also studied film at Ryerson and have done basically all the kind of training programs you can think of that CBC and the NFB and CBC have, have kind of dreamed up. Cool. So, so uh, cool. Well, yeah, that's really, again, inspirational. It's, it's, it's amazing to think about all those sort of, um, all those things coming together to kind of create this this amazing opportunity for, for work. It's, it's really wonderful. And it's certainly Imaginative has been doing so much and giving back so much to the community. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, and I, I, I feel like I'm, I should also say, like with, with Slashback, I also had these amazing producers that, that with, um, including Stacey and Alethea up in Nunavut, um, but also Dan Beckerman and Chris Yerkovich and, and Alex Ordanis in Toronto. Um, and then Adam Garnet Jones, I just have to say, at Telefilm has been amazing. And having having an Indigenous person at an institution like Telefilm, as um, I think his official title is Indigenous Liaison, um, but having that person there that's from the community that we um, we all know and who's a filmmaker himself, I think is a is a great benefit. Cool. Okay, that's really wonderful. So, okay, I'll now ask the same of Nancy. So my I kind of stumble upon art making by accident. Um, I I haven't done any training, so that's um, so anyone could really participate um, with this with now with the internet um, and the supportive community. You know, I kind of move within a more underground grassroots. Um, kind of organizing community based in music first. And then I, I was in documentary filmmaking prior to this. I got into that, uh, especially documenting um, Chinese Canadian history. Um, and then through that and playing with cameras, I got into music video uh, directing. Um, and then through that, I got into um, uh, doing VJ work in like underground rapes and parties. Um, and then through that, I kind of got into doing installations and then making those installations um, interactive, which we'll see later. I do have a video trailer that will show you some of that. Um, and then through that, it was like as a filmmaker and as a media artist uh, interested in interactive work, I felt like, you know, to, in 2017, it was just like a natural thing for me to get interested in VR because it's kind of the merging between like it's a cinematic, ele there's a cinematic element to the storytelling, but then there's this also very technically intense um, process where a lot of media artists um, go through uh, in terms of like technical uh, troubleshooting or like learning new softwares um, within like very short amounts of time to figure out how to execute an idea you have in your head. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of been my journey um, from, you know, just being interested in documenting Chinese Canadian history here um, into through music and through community building um, into my um, work now uh, as an XR uh, creator. Um, and a lot of my other work is I do a lot of community organizing. Um, I'm a co-founder and co-produce for uh, current Feminist Electronic Arts Symposium. And, uh, you know, for me, I think it's really important, you know, as an artist um, to uh, continuously engage politically because uh, for, you know, for 
BIPOCs, you know, being taking up space in, especially in this, in film, in academia, in um, music, in, you know, media art or VR, it's, it's a very political thing to even take up space there. Um, so, so like a big part of um, my practice is also building in, uh, building in like an educational or like mentorship component within my practice, um, because I, I just think it's, it's so important because I, I did not have, you know, like, like a proper, like, um, arts education. I learned from my community and it's only right for me to be able to give that back and to learn new skills and to build a uh, facilitate workshops and educational programming and mentorship uh, for other members um, of my community. I mostly work with BIPOC and women of color and the queer community. Cool. Well, again, like it's so inspirational. I mean, you, you know, you both bring so much depth of experience and depth of, of, of purpose the purpose of, you know, um, why you're there, but what, what drives you, what, what makes it, what makes storytelling important to both of you. So thank you for all that. So now I'm going to do this question that I sent to you earlier, and I hope I'm, um, I hope it makes sense. Um, so in Cree, um, there are words about space. Tawa, space, is one of the words. And then even though I'm not fluent in my language, but I, as I say, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> I'm, I gain more words every year, um, who, but I did search out words. When I was doing my work, I would search out words like, what, how would this be? What would this word be? Like, how would, this, how would, how would I feel these sounds in, 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 um, in the language? So um, I did search out the words for space back in the day when I was thinking about how we make space for one another um, regarding telling stories and access to the means to tell stories. We, but there's a group of us, including people like Marjorie Bocage and, um, you know, um, Maria Campbell was involved as well. But um, um, we were uh, created something at the, at the BAM Center. It was called Aboriginal Arts Center. And um, we were creating space. We were thinking about space and trying to invite people into the circle and maybe expand the circle all the time. So that's kind of when I was starting thinking about this word. And uh, but then going into XR, it's sort of takes on new meaning it, it, anyway. So I was thinking about how we make space for telling stories. And I asked speakers who taught me that and it made me think about how there is always space. The circle is never closed. And now because of immersive, it made me think of how I, I imagine space in a virtual space. So is there a word, a concept in your language, stories, cultural ways that influence how you express and experience space within immersive um, spaces and so I thought maybe because Nancy if you mind now like Nancy was kind of like telling me about this how it sort of set off a whole, a whole chain event of energy going on and uh, the people she works with so I'm wondering if we could start with Nancy on this one. Sure yeah thank you for the amazing question I it really kind of made me think a lot um, about my own my own language. So my first language, I mean, kind of first, I came here when I was one years old, my family um, speaks Mandarin. Um, so I'm Taiwanese. Um, and um, I learned Chinese in Canada. So I didn't actually learn Chinese when I was in Taiwan. So I've actually learned it, you know, here. Um, and it was a really important process for my parents to uh, teach me the language. Like it was not easy to learn Chinese in Canada at all. Um, but they were like very hardcore about it. And now that I'm older and I, I can really appreciate the wisdom that is embedded in such an old language. Um, so when uh, Loretta sent the email asking us, um, you know, what space uh, means to us in our language, the first word that came to my um, head was uh, which actually means world. I wrote it out. Um, <laughs> it's um, very high tech. Um, <laughs> Uh, so essentially, um, I, I love Chinese etymology, um, but the first character means um, era, um, it means generation, it means a dynasty, it's a measure of time, and then uh, means a domain, a zone, a boundary. So um, essentially, the, the word for world means like a, a domain for generations. Um, and when you break down the etymology for the word um, Shi, which is the the word for generation era um the pictogram like from i think three thousand years ago is leaves it's three leaves on a branch um and essentially 
it, it grew as, you know, as language changed, it became this, which is um, seal script. And this is now the Han character that we, uh, we now know. So essentially the, the character for generation comes from the idea that, um, uh, that foliage grows on a tree. And that essentially means like, means a generation um, with a successful foliage on a tree. Um, and that, um, and in terms of like the ideogrammic like compound of the word, uh, shi, it actually means this is like the character for 10 and this is the character for 20. So it actually means like 30. So 30 years makes up a generation. Um, and a generation is what makes up the con it's a generation is what makes up the foundational concept for the term shijie, world um, that we live in. Um, and that the world is understood through the passing of time and humans carrying the generations uh, forward. Um, and the universe is beyond what we perceive through our five senses that we're used to, that the universe is perceived through this generational uh, passage. Um, and that the world that we, in order to have a world that we live in, um, it exists in the past, present, and future. And I like what you said about how, you know, space is never like a closed circle. And in this case, that, that's, that's the idea is that the world, it's not a closed circle because you can go infinitely into the past and infinitely into the future. And that kind of extends, you know, beyond like any kind of uh, closed circle or a closeness that we would have. So, yeah. Cool. That was us, again, more, more brilliant, more brilliant. But it's really interesting because it does speak to, I mean, and, and you know, and, and, uh, and our Cree culture, we talk about, you know, the generations and, and, you know, and time has these sort of interesting uh, ways of being expressed um, that sort of makes time sort of endless as well and past, present and future kind of coexisting. And, uh, and, it, and it's interesting too, because it's like, how do you experience the infinite within a finite world and it, it becomes really it becomes quite brilliant and, and our, our ancestors thought of that in terms of the language they found ways of expressing that in terms of the language and kind of codifying that and and it, it's so brilliant so yeah thank you those are those are really um, you know really um great great learning that's great learning for us so thank you for sharing so Nyla um how would how would you feel how do you answer some some of this yeah, I've been actually exploring one particular word for a little while. Um, it's really kind of inspired this project that I'm working on. It's an XR project in partnership with Winnipeg Art Gallery um, and the Glenn Gould Foundation and a few other amazing partners. But really, it um, I first learned of the word through uh, Susan Aglukark. Like you, I'm I don't know my I I wasn't raised with my language. Um, but she described it to me as, um, well, it directly translates to mean breath. It's, the word is sila. And um, so the direct translation is breath, but the concept of sila is actually, um, the, for lack of a better word, uh, the belief system of Inuit, um, the kind of spiritual belief system. And it's one that kind of... Um, Sila kind of is imagined as this breath that exists and connects every living thing. Um, so almost like this kind of connecting material that kind of is closer to us than our skin to our clothes. Um, and it connects us with um, basically anything that's living. Um, and the shaman in particular had um, some element of, of uh, control over Sila in the sense that they could communicate with the spirits that and the spirits kind of influence Sila um, to a larger extent. So for me, just kind of exploring this idea of, um, of breath and this kind of life force. And I really do kind of think, <laughs> think about it kind of like the force in Star Wars, um, that it's um, this kind of this life force that exists. And so for me, I'm kind of imagining in this visual, like in this, in this kind of virtual environment, how do we um, visualize that? And, and how do, what would that sound like? Um, and getting to have those kinds of conversations of kind of, of, um, of creating uh, this actual virtual world that can be a rep rep represent this kind of, um, this idea. 
And um, so it's really kind of a fun process of exploring like what what does what does Sila sound like? And if it sounds like does it sound different to me than it does to you? And if it sounds like something to me and if and if if it sounds like something to you, if we come and connect, maybe those two pieces of, of music can connect and become something entirely new and really kind of exploring those things that way. Um, so it's it's it, it was it's been really nice having this kind of common um, really just kind of drawing it back to this one word. Um, and for me, it was kind of just important on a on a thematic level because um, the project that I'm doing is really a response to um, a piece of of, in, of radio that Glenn Gould, the Canadian pianist, had produced with the CBC and the NFB in 1967. And it was called The Idea of North. And it really was um, kind of Gould's interpretation of the Arctic. Um, and for me, what, and it was made up of all of these interviews of essentially settler Canadians on this, tr this newly built train from Churchill, uh, sorry, from Winnipeg, w Winnipeg up to Churchill. And, and it uses all of these layers of, of audio and these radio recordings of interviews of the people on the train. And the, the one kind of voice, of course, that's left out is the, is the people that live in the Arctic. Um, and so that perspective is entirely from the, the settler Canadians. And so for this piece that when we're kind of talking about making space is really kind of focusing on that, that missing piece in the conversation. Um, and kind of what the idea of North means um, to me as an Inuk. And, and for Gould, who kind of saw, who saw the Arctic and romanticized it as a place of isolation and solitude, for me, it's very much about community and connection and this idea of, of Sila, which, um, which is very different from the one kind of represented in, in Gould's piece. Oh yeah, again, you know, such um, I mean, drawing drawing from all that sort of knowledge that you know our ancestors g gave us, really, um, you know, the, the generations to you know, I mean, they. It's funny, you know. Sometimes I asked a question in a film, and people kind of mocked me for it, but nonetheless, I asked it because if there is no if if past, present, and future all exist, then really, you know, the ancestors are here. You know, and 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 the yet to be born children are are, are here or you know, very close. So um, I think this these uh, ideas of space are, are you know are really are reflected in our language and reflected in those relationships that we have with one another and with the land. It's interesting when when you talk about breath. Um, I also think of the wind. And, and um, when I was making Forgotten Warriors, uh, I know more than one veteran told me stories about when they were overseas in battle they would send a message home to say they were fine. And the people at home would get that message. It would be through the air and they would know that they were okay. Or I also had people who were, you know, family who stayed at home. I talked to them and they said they knew, they knew on the wind that someone had died. So there was, um, you know, there's this, this sort of, um, you know, if it's all energy, you know, and we're going into these virtual spaces that, that are also playing with, you know, um, with energy, the energy that's being created through through zeros and ones, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting, um, or I guess until we get to quantum computing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how our ancestors seem to be so brilliant and, and give us the tools today to be thinking about our work. Um, and, and, and Cree is also kind of interesting. Some people say if you learn the syllabics, the sounds of the syllabics, that's really the best way to learn the language because it's the sounds, it's the, the vibrations that the sounds create that really is at the essence of the word. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very um, enlightening to hear just about um, how, we're, how we're, we're carried, if you like, by our ancestors today. Um, so thank you for that. Now I'm gonna ask you the, another question I had. So um, a dear friend and, and, and a relative, uh, James Nicholas, who's now gone, um, who was a poet, taught me a lot about space. We used to have long conversations about the language and about the work he did and uh, sharing stories about transcending space because we talked, he was the one, he always, he knew he'd been in this universe many times. So, um, and he also was very close to some of his relatives who had been medicine people. 
And um, I don't think XR can replicate the powers of those medicine people, but his stories have influenced me when imagining immersive spaces. Is there any elder or cultural people who have influenced how you imagine your immersive um, projects? And I'll, I'll start with Nyla this time. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think in, in and in different ways. Well, in the Sila project that I I mentioned, I might as well just kind of go on that. The reason I kind of started getting involved in it is I was actually I went to visit the Winnipeg Art Gallery. They've got the largest collection of Inuit art in the world, um, kind of on loan since there's nowhere to host it in Nunavut yet, um, and so. I walked into the gallery and there was this um, pedestal with beautiful lighting and this coat that was made of caribou skin. And I recognized it right away as my great, great grandfather's coat because I have a photo of him. Um, and so it was this, it's been a really kind of interesting process. Um, it, the, the coat is known as the shaman's coat. He was considered one of the last shaman of the Arctic before, um, before the traditional belief systems were uh, replaced by Christianity. Um, so it's been kind of a really interesting process for me to be able to go and be doing research and really kind of learning about some of my family history. Um, and it's definitely, it's, it's difficult when you kind of are talking about these kinds of stuff in, in my community, of course, um, because these, these belief systems and even the belief system of Sila, um, these are things that I recognize are, I'm really lucky to be able to even talk about, um, that these are ideas that elders of mine who I work with and, and cause I, I work with elders in, in kind of a lot of my work in varying capacities. Um, and recently I was told this story by uh, an elder who worked with my, um, with my father and they're of the same generation, um, men in their, in their mid to late sixties. And they have these amazing stories and these that, that they can share and, and ideas that they can, they can share with me, but it's really that they're kind of a generation that were taken from living nomadically on the land and brought into residential schools away from their families um, and really made to, to feel shame in their indigeneity. And not only that, but um, kind of, it was these kinds of ideas of, of drum dancing, throat singing, tattoos, um, were re and Sila were rebranded as, as uh, devil worship and Satanism. So to even be able to, um, after kind of uh, uh, be being a part of the church, to kind of, relearn those things and and relearn the drum and be able to like like this elder that I work with be able to he's now a teacher at, at the high school and he teaches drum dancing and how to make drums but for him to kind of get to that point um to be able to do that is is really kind of a blessing and so for me to kind of be able to talk so freely about this kind of stuff without any real shame is um is just something I have to constantly be reminding myself of and reminding other people that this that that this is that these kinds of things even if I might take them to go and, and make a scary movie or something you know that that these are um that that these are special and valuable thank you thank you yeah it, it is it's it's it is a challenge you know it's like how like even with me using coyote for coyote science, I mean, Wasakachak plays many roles, you know, in pre-culture, he's, he's a trickster, of course, um, but there's also, you know, he's part of the origin stories is, is you know, he's a, he's a teacher, but he also represents um, um, chaos and flux and, you know, the universe is this place of flux and, uh, and of change always. So that's something I embodied, but I also was, uh, and tried to anyways, with furry character, you know, <laughs> in, in a children's show, but it, it's true. There's always that kind of um, that special place you have to kind of um, navigate respectfully because a lot of that stuff is very sacred knowledge, and um, you know you don't you don't want to. And it's medicine, you know. So we you know we have to be very respectful of that and be careful of it and understand the power of it. 
even if sometimes we don't. But um, yeah, so thanks for that, Nyla. And then I'm going to ask uh, Nancy the same question. Um, so for me, in terms of elders, um, you know, I my only ancestor um, left right now is my mother. Um, my grandma, um, which is her mom, uh, passed away two years ago. And since she passed away, you know, that was kind of like my only link because there was a lot of there was, you know, they, my grandparents fled from China into Taiwan. Um, so there's lots of disconnect with history and understanding your past um, because of World War II. Um, so since my grandma passed away, I became, um, you know, like I've had this desire to connect with other Chinese elders. So I started uh, last fall, I started taking Chinese calligraphy lessons at the Buddhist temple in Richmond, um, just as a way to kind of connect um, with the community and also like I was brought up in a Buddhist family too um, so and I've just been kind of um, uh, detached from that until recently that I'm reintroduced uh, to to Buddhism uh, through this like calligraphy practice with Chinese elders you know I'm the youngest person in the room everybody else that's doing callig that taking that calligraphy lesson they're all like 60 to 90 years old um, so that experience has been, it, it has been really nice for me to kind of reconnect with some of the Buddhist concepts. Um, and, you know, in Buddhism, we believe in reincarnation um, and that, you know, when you die, you reincarnate depending on your like, um, on your like karmic entanglements and the relationships um, attachments you have in this world, you reincarnate, your spirit reincarnates into this new uh, a, different life in a, in a different body, but still the same uh, spirit. Um, but like, for example, you could, a teacher from this life um, that I have a deep relationship with in the next life that I may reincarnate and um, she may reincarnate um, and that we might be in a different kind of configuration. You know, my teacher from this lifetime might be my daughter in my next life. Um, and that, you know, I think about immerse and this like really shapes the way I think about immersive spaces, because, you know, in immersive spaces, I think about it as a new reincarnation. Every time we enter an um, immersive space, it's like we're being born again into this new existence, but um, we're still hanging on to the memories and um, the karmic entanglement that our bodies still carry. So our bodies, we do not enter an immersive environment as a neutral being. Uh, much like reincarnation, you don't reincarnate into a new life as like a clean slate. You reincarnate into your new life with all of your past relationship from your past life that is entangled and that will manifest in new relationships in your new life. Um, and, you know, like a, a lot of my, the, with the VR dance film title traces that I did with um, Emelina Fredrickson, um, a huge part of our research was looking at the ethics of VR. Um, just because when you bring somebody into such an immersive spaces, our bodies are archives and we carry so much, so much memory, so much trauma, so much, you know, so much baggage in some ways too. Like when we enter into this VR world, you know, oftentimes we might feel very um, violated or, uh, you know, tra traumatized or sick, or we might have like physical reactions um, that, you know, might not be good for us um, in immersive spaces. So that's a big thing. Um, that I think about when I create immersive environments is that, you know, understanding that bodies are not neutral beings. Are we With all the things that are stored into their body. So even though this is a new world that they're experiencing, they are still carrying um, all the things that they remember in their body. Oh, well, that's really, yeah, actually, that's, that's sort of like, you know kind of direction i was going now if like with this 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 these continuums this continuum of knowledge and continuum and practices our culture how is that influencing your practice and nancy that was a great a great example and obviously in content and obviously in how we design and work with people but the actual concept of of that immersive space i mean Nala, do you want to speak a little bit to that as well no i well i just think that 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 idea is really is um I th and I think that that's why it's so important also to have diversity in tech, um, that these kinds of questions, I, I think these are questions that kind of women would also be thinking about in different ways. I, and also just from my experience, like actually being with a group of women having tried different experiences and somebody being like, 
wait a minute, I don't like to be in spaces where I don't know what's behind me. And realizing that that, that, that for some people, we, that some environments weren't safe and that kind of, you know, just this kind of, uh, but it, it, these are things that just would, if you're not, if you don't have that kind of understanding or understanding that that might, people might be carrying that in with them, then, then it might go unnoticed. And those are really kind of important things to be thinking about. Um, and just the larger kind of idea about the ethics of, of VR is so, um, I think, really important. Well, but I mean, the idea also is very, very fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there was, um, I mean, I, I remember t attending a VR event a couple of years ago at, at uh, at VIP actually immersed and there was uh, this debate going on between 360 or 180 do we do you know what happens when you create a 360 world versus a 180 world and you know do you you know it, it, but it was being discussed by uh, white guys and for them it was basically well do we really need the 360 because that's just going to cost more money and that's just you know or do it's 180 no one's going to really look you know it's, it's, it's a, like it was more a tech question rather than an ethical question like you say what who's in there with you what what's behind you what's around you how safe do you feel you know and and you know what are is that our spaces to create i know that when um one of the uh the projects i think it was the uh, you guys have, have nyla you probably can Correct me. The commodity, the commodity uh, group out of the states, out of the, the art, the art collective, commodity. Anyways, they did a VR with um, with Abtech, and I experienced it, and it was very um, upsetting. Like it made me throw on and throw up, and um, and they moved a lot. The camera moved a lot, and um, that, but the, the programmer who I talked to said they did that deliberately because they wanted to unsettle the the the, 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 the participant, which you know they imagine primarily white who would be experiencing the kind of unsettledness and the unease and the, the you know the, this this you know of of this environment you know so that it's not just comfortable for them and uh so i mean and, and also the fact again talk about ethics of, of vr is you know what what information is being collected of our bodies when we're in those spaces and, and you know who gets to use that um, that knowledge and those, you know, those sort of physical reactions that we're, we're having in space. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's why it, it is critical. You, you guys are, you know, really speaking to that. It is really critical that we be in these spaces because these technologies will, you know, become greater means of surve uh, sub um, surveillance, you know, greater ways of control. And I think that's what's really critical for us to be here because that's- And, um, and uh, it was pointed out, it is post-commodity. And they, I think that was the piece that they had done with uh, Abtech out of Montreal, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That was actually, so I uh, that was, I produced um, a couple of those and, and Abtech produced a, a few of those. And I remember that was a specific intent. And um, which, is in, which, is, which is, of course, a valid point, but then you also have to kind of wonder, um, I, like then it's kind of like, you know, do you put a, an advisory or something? You will throw up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, although, you know, I also sat in one that was that um, VIP had, you know, at one of their events, um, their um, immersed events, that was a $20 million um, ride. And I got still got sick in that too. And it was mo supposed to be all about pleasure. We were being chased by um, skeletal ghost dinosaurs. So, um Fear, fear seems to be a big thing that moves a lot of these, uh, thing, a lot of these VR projects. Um, okay, well then, then here is a question. I'm, I'm sure we're going to start getting questions soon. Um, and um, I see a question coming soon, so I'm just going to do the one last question. Uh, actually, let's wrap this. Let's do these questions. This last question, if we have time, so that uh, so that we can get some of the questions coming from the um, um, people who are listening. Um, um, okay, so here is the first one. Um, okay, how do you mitigate your respective cross-cultural heritage in your artistic practices when your connection to language has been halted? So, um, Nyla, do you want to do you, do you want sure. to answer that? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that there's. Um... It's, so I, I can think of Slashback in particular um, because Slashback was a movie that 
um, that I just recently shot and it's not out yet. We haven't even finished film yet, but it's my first feature film about a group of girls that chase aliens and battle them up in, in a community in Nunavut. And with that, um, the girls, some of the girls and I don't speak in Nukitu. Some of the girls didn't speak fully, uh, fluently in Nukitu, even though they live in, in a Halui, um, in Nunavut. Um, and there was also, um, kind of like how much in Nukitu do we want to, we, do we want to have? Like for me, it was, we had all of the adults speaking in Nukitu and all the kids spoke English with like a, with a, a bit of a Nukitu kind of blended in, um, some, and it's, it, for that, it was um, obviously working with uh, someone who is fluent in Institute, and is, it, I have, I'm lucky enough that my my sister in law is an amazing. Um, she's from the community that we were from, and she's done. She's works has done translation work in the past. So um, and then, but we also had an elder um, in the community, Madeline, who was also translating all of our community notices um, for our for our team and and also doing all of our radio announcements on the local radio for the community in Inuktitut. Um, and obviously just to kind of even get to be um, filming in the community, we had to ask permission from the Hamlet, which is part of the Pathways and Protocols outlined by Imaginative and Ontario Creates, but we had to reach out in Inuktitut and have that translated and, and that kind of stuff. Those things are um, take extra time and money and so you have to make sure that the budget those things in and then also making sure that um, that if uh, if I want this to be available in an of course that work has to be done as well. Should this be a good time to show a clip then? Yeah sure. Yeah, like, got, yeah. yeah so this is a little a trailer that we that well our sales agent have put together but it's it's the movie's not done it doesn't have sound design but it gives you a, a little sense. Let's go for a ride on the boat. Yes. I'll tell mommy you're taking the boat out. I'll tell mom I caught you eating that stick of butter in the middle of the night. <laughs> But what they don't know is that we're the best hunters there is. Cool. It looks amazing. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, I look forward to that for sure. Yeah, no, I, I you know, like there's, um, you know, that, that taking all those elements that you've been talking about and trying to create this place of, of, of tension, of, of, you know, of energy. It really is. It's, I mean, that's really what we do, right, is we work with energy. And, and there's more, so many places to work with energy. Um, I'm going to quickly ask another question here. I'm going to ask another question of Nancy. Um, what are your thoughts on the tension between creating artifacts that hold your generational memories for these to last forever versus unsustainable tools and gadgets that help us produce art? Pretty heavy. <laughs> they were both pretty heavy questions, actually. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm immediate. I, I, okay, so 
I'm a media artist and there, I think there's an element to being a media artist that is like kind of, um, you know, it's with media are like, I don't create um, physical artifacts. I'll do, although I do have a new project where it's going to be my first time creating physical um, artifacts. Um, but I think it's, that's why the activism part is so important because as artists, as media artists, you know, we're using cell phones and they have chips that are, you know, that are mined uh, from places and, you know, we create e-waste um, that, you know, get dumped in Asia and like our participation as artists in this capitalist society, you know, causes, it does, we have to acknowledge that we are perpetuating some of the harm that is being caused, you know, with environmental degradation, with uh, labor, um, like with human rights um, kind of uh, infractions and, and things like that. Um, so like, I, that's, that's why part of my work and my practice as an artist is not only to, yes, tell the stories that I need to tell um, that are for my answers that I need to tell, but also being acknowledging um, the world that we participate in. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, we have privilege to be able to have access to all this technology um, that, you know, many people don't have access to as well, too. So it's not only, it's a responsibility um, for us as cultural producers um, to continue to do the work um, in the community, to continue uh, to acknowledge um, the damage that we might be done, doing to the community by taking, um, you know, uh, resources from the earth and also making sure that now that we do have the technology that we can access it, making sure that we're trying to do what we can to make this technology um, and make these gadgets and things like that um, and the skill sets accessible for people who may not have had the privilege to learn how to use them. Cool. I mean, I'm gonna go back to Nyla just for a little bit about your film. I mean, one of the things I know, I can't remember who said this, who does a lot of work with um, youth and they said, you know, I go where the youth are, like, you know, you take the learning to where the youth are, you take them. So the youth are, and I mean, I know you're not old, but, you know, you're youth too, but, it, you know, the people in your film are, are young. So this is not really a VR question, but it's still kind of related. So they are like horror films, right? So that's the thing, right? So horror is a, is a thing, it's where the youth are. Um, and there's certainly many, does, how does that kind of connect also with, you know, your cultural storytelling and the kind of narratives that surround, you know, I, I was reading this, you know, a bunch of Osaka Chak stories I've heard. And some of them are very, very simple and pretty and, you know, funny. And, and then there's other ones where they're horrific, where there's, you know, you know, Wasaka, I never heard that, that, you know, in the creation story that it was Wasaka who killed all the animals, you know, so that way the world was flooded and that's why he had to go and, you know, so the, all the water animals, I mean, that was something I've heard new. So that's a kind of like a whole different take on Wasaka Jack. I know he was always out trying to kill this and eat that and do this, but this is like, oh, this is sort of like taking it to another level. I mean, I know we also have other, you know, wouldn't go in that and in, in our storytelling, but they're kind of lessons, they're lessons. Wouldn't they're, is a t teaching about greed. Um, so I'm just wondering how does that sort of fit within your narrative, um, continuing of narrative within your communities? Yeah, well, I think like when you say kind of when you're talking about the young people and and I, I think for me, when I was a kid, I grew up watching movies like Jaws and The Goonies and E.T. and stuff like that. and never really saw kind of um, me or my community or anything kind of like that represented. So that was something that was important to me. But I mean, this movie was, it, it was kind of fun because the, the, the threat is aliens, um, but the girls themselves, you know, we, we, fear is such a big part of our storytelling. And you, and you talk about our, our lessons and, and cautionary tales. Um, children's stories often are cautionary tales that are, are meant to kind of instill a lesson. And in the Arctic, um, the environment's just so harsh that that our stories are that much more frightening, I think. Um, and so I've had friends that are First Nations who tell stories about the about the Northern Lights, for instance, and they've they've got these kind of beautiful stories about what the, the Northern Lights mean to them. And and then and then I'm just like, really? Like that sounds beautiful. Where I come from, the Northern Lights are, you know, that are there to 
chop off your head and then the spirits will play soccer with your skull and that will like create the sound of thunder and that's just like our, all of our stories are really really scary um but i think that kind of fear and laughter kind of go hand in hand there's lots of kind of laughing games within inuit culture as well um i think that it um so it kind of is a combination of these lessons but also um I, you know, we just kind of have a, a kind of a cultural history of trying to scare the shit out of each other. Yeah, yeah. well, I, yeah, yeah, because Northern Lights, I mean, all are one of the, we've, I've heard many stories, but one of the, we're not supposed to whistle at the Northern Lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what I want to, okay, so, so um, Nancy, um, so, you know, we, we see this kind of connection with, um, with Nyla's work, I'm wondering because you've got this sort of this this is there something I don't know the work you're going to show, I think has to do with music, and I'm wondering whether you know how it, music has influenced how you design immersive experiences, or how it you design, um, you know your kind of your artwork. I'm wondering if is that some, something you'd like to talk about. Um, yeah, so music is kind of like the bond for me. It's the glue for me in my community. Um, you know, I, I do film and I do like immersive tech and all this stuff, but like my primary kind of community that offers me all of the emotional support is directly through the music community. Um, I also DJ as well, so I'm, I am involved. Um, I do festivals and things like that. So it's kind of the glue and offers me the base, the basis of my like emotional um, support foundation. And does that influence your immersive experiences that you create? I mean, every, I mean, most filmmakers will talk to you, talk about how music, you know, editing is like music, film is like music. It's just visual. It's it's you know, it's, it's to me, it's always more. That's what I always think. See, I think of my films more as as music and not not as sentences. It's just you know, it's like you know harmonies and, and, and different levels of energy and so on. Yeah, totally. And, you know, like mo all my works um, are audiovisual um, work. So, you know, that's the music is just as important. The sound design, my collaborator, Kieran Bumber, um, I do have a video that has a lot of our collaborative works together that we can show after this. Um, she's a composer, educator, um, and sound designer. So I work very closely with her um, to create all of our collaborative uh, media art pieces. And yeah, music takes just as much as like, music is just as equal uh, to the visual um, when I do um, create media artworks. Cool, so should we show that now? Um... Sure. Yeah, so I'll just quickly, um, There's uh, the video is three trailers. Um, one is Pendula. It's an interactive swing uh, project. It's my first immersive um, art project that I've ever done. Um, it was a bunch of swing sets at a rave. Um, and then I had projections and it was not interactive. And then I met Kieran at that party and she was like, hey, look, I can make that interactive for you. Um, that's what I do. I study like music technology. So we started collaborating and then we created that Pendula project. Uh, the second project is um, Title Traces. It's a 360 dance film um, collaborating with Emelina Fredrickson. Um, that's the, the, dan the 360 dance film that we shot out in the intertidal mudflats of Boundary Bay. So we dragged um, the Google, um, it's the, the Odyssey, the Odyssey into the ocean, uh, GoPro Odyssey into the ocean and shot um, a dance film um, using that rig. And then the last video, it's Kieran and I's um, collaborative VR, uh, networked VR concert experience. So yeah, go ahead and play the video. Okay, cool. Thanks.
That was beautiful. I now have to go and experience all those things, I guess, post COVID, um, <laughs> which actually is another discussion in itself, just how, you know, how COVID, how immersive technologies can actually, you know, the, the role that they in COVID or kind of post COVID world, we're actually kind of excited about it because it's expanding us beyond Vancouver. We're looking at new ways to be able to bring our training and production beyond the city. So, but that's not the question. So <laughs> I will, that's beautiful. Both of your work is so beautiful and powerful. Really can't wait. Someone's asked uh, when we when we can watch your film, Nyla, but it sounds like it's next year, right? So when next it's year at some point, we're we're um, busy working on the VFX and music. Tribe Called Red is making the music, which is incredible. But we're actually we had planned to go and there's a tiny little bit of filming we have to do up in Pang still, and we had planned to go up at the end of March, and that obviously was canceled at the last minute. So we're just waiting until we can, but we're not stressing. We're not rushing this thing. It can get filmed whenever. Um, it's not with the, it doesn't have, it's not with the girls who are aging by the day. Um, so when it's, when it's free for us to go up there without risk to anybody, then we'll, then we'll head up and finish the movie. So probably next year. Cool. So I'm going to ask uh, Sasha a question. Sasha MacArthur worked with us when uh, Alana was on mat leave. So we have, she's dear to our heart. She's an amazing artist and filmmaker in her own right. Um, when you are considering your origin stories, do you bring in elders or how do you access and research your stories? So uh, maybe I'll put that to, to Nyla. Just, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that it's um, kind of, I think depends on the story. So for me, if it's, uh, I've done a project where it involved um, Inuit myth, or even in this project, I've, I, I included, um, I didn't actually include any mythical creatures, but they, the girls talk about creatures like the Mahaha or the Kadupidlu. Um, and for those kinds of things, you really uh, want to just be hearing as many stories as possible. Um, and some of those, those myths and legends can change from community to community. Um, so it's, it, for me, it's, uh, about going and kind of, um, hearing different stories is always really interesting to me. Uh, it kind of opens up a different kind of question about, um, ownership of, and IP of, of indigenous ideas that I think is kind of interesting because I don't, I, I, nobody owns the Kadupitu myth, for instance, but we do talk about indigenous representation, especially now these days. Um, but even with that, in, as an Inuk, I wouldn't say that I have like free range to go and do whatever I want with the Kadupitu myth. I think that um, as an indigenous person, it comes with a lot of responsibility um, to your community that you're, um, trying to be as um, respectful as possible. So for me, um, consulting with elders for sure. Um, but I also don't, we'll do stuff that's not necessarily based on a particular myth. Um, Slashback itself is just an, a new idea. It's just an alien invasion movie, um, which isn't even that original, but it just is, takes place within this indigenous community. So it doesn't have any kind of indigenous um, creatures or anything like that to draw from. It really was just um, drawn from kind of my teen, uh, teenage experience, my experience as a young Indigenous person, and then also working closely with these young girls um, and and how they kind of were processing the world. Cool. That, well, that, there's a second half of that from uh, Colette who asks, have you ever encountered um, someone was against the idea that, that said no? Um, no, I haven't, but I have said no, and I've, um, I, and, and there have been other projects that have kind of come forward with it. I've encouraged other people to say no. Um, I, uh, this, um, the, in, and, and like I had said to you previously about the understanding the, how special these stories are, um, some of these myths and stuff, they are really cool stories that, could um, could totally be in a Marvel comic or something like that, but it's also you know we have to understand what what these are as well, and that they it, um, that um, so I think that for me it's I've always found that Inuit that I've talked to have always been very um, welcoming of the idea of being involved, but I also I will also encourage people to refer to the pathways and protocols 
protocols document. I'm not sure in BC if it's kind of as was widely spread. Um, that, but in Ontario Creates and Imaginative here in Toronto have put together a pathways and protocols document that really kind of outlines um, how to engage with Indigenous communities in storytelling. And they do have some pretty um, great kind of um, rules to follow in there, I find. Um, and, and, and that really kind of goes back to it, that con the idea of consultation is a little outdated and, and that, you know, that, um, and, it, and so there's different ways that you can, that I, that I, I kind of um, will incorporate elders or credit elders, but making sure that they're getting paid um, and paid properly and that sort of thing. Um, and I just remind, I was told to remind um, folks that I'm also going to be kind of having another talk on Friday in a couple of days um, through VIF um, and uh, just to kind of expand on, on kind of how I um, have kind of gotten some of the interactive projects I've done off the ground. And, uh, well, yeah, through, um, well, actually it's an IM4 with, well, with VIF, VIF, I think that's what you mean. Um, I always got to plug in the IM4. Sure. I know it's funny because some of the, the, the DJ guys were going, well, immerse the VIF. And it's like, no, it's, it's IM4. It's like, you know, we got we gotta, we got to sing our songs too. Um, so very quickly, I think I'm going to ask this question of Nancy because we have to wrap up soon. Um, and it sounds like you're already doing this anyways, Nancy. And if you want to add Nyla, that'd be great. But um, what are the ways you, do you think you can bring more inclusion to tech? Any actionable steps we can perform as as individuals? Um, at, well, edu like providing space for that is really important. So you know, it's not just me doing my own project as an artist and me taking up space, offering room within my projects to have other um, BIPOCs, women, queer folks involved is really important. Um, you know, and also. You know, like the thing is, the, the thing is, sometimes you know, I think about it, and you know, I think about the film industry, I think about the music industry, mm -hmm. uh, or even like creative tech. Is like I don't really want to participate in that patriarchal structure. You know, like I don't really want to be a part of that. You know, this like white supremacist patriarchal structure. So I think it is really important um, to to be able to feel empowered. Um, to create and carve your own space uh, to do that work. Because, you know, a lot of my projects, I feel like it would never, you know, there's no, it doesn't make money in that way. Um, so there's no, it, really there's no room for some of my projects in that like patriarchal, um, like uh, film or like tech uh, structure. So I'm kind of, part of me, I'm kind of just like, nah, like I'm not even gonna, not even gonna try to do that. I'm gonna focus on creating you know, a space that's like, you know, BIPOC, for BIPOC, run by BIPOC, you know? So I think that's also really important to like, remember that like, we don't have to assimilate to that system. Uh, we have the ability um, and there's, you know, there's so many people that are being able, that are able to help us build our own platform and our own kind of universe for us to live in and to create, to create in. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we certainly, you know, envisioned for IM4 Lab is that right now we're focusing on Indigenous people, but, you know, we were, you know, uh, um, Magda, the filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, asked if she could come into one of our workshops. And, you know, it's like, um, because we, you know, those collaborations be between Indigenous and, you know, people of color, Black people, and, you know, um, um, within the queer world, all, you know, those are all the spaces that we can do. This I always think of sort of like a, critical mass. I mean, that, that's why IM4 is inclusive. I mean, we're right now trying to create safe space for Indigenous people to be able to, you know, play with the technology. And, and I think that's one thing people really value um, because there's no like, you got to learn this today. If you don't learn this today, then you're a failure. Or, you know, you're not good at this. It's like, no, oh, this is the space I need to learn it at. And then they can come back again and learn it again and take, come back if they have to take two or three times to kind of like absorb it. And we're really fortunate that our instructors, you know, are, are in the same kind of wavelength with, with that vision. So it's not, um, you know, hype, hype, hype. And it, to me, it's also kind of like a, it's an osmosis process. You know, you just live with it and, and you know, like, like middle of night, this thought comes up, right? And then you go, oh yeah, I can do this or I can do that. And, and um, again, those collaborations, finding those collaborations. What we do need is more programmers. I think that's one thing that we really need. I know that's been happening, you know, people like 
um, Cheryl Rondell, you know, back in the day was was programming and she was bringing Cree into programming. And I know that Moni is a Mohawk woman who's been programming and bringing Mohawk into into when she programs. Um, you know, Michael, I, I'm, I'm mentioning the people that we work with, right? But there, there are other Native people who are working in programming and so on. But that's one area I'd really like to do more to do sort of indigenized or, you know, diverse space for programming so that we're um, not being not being influenced by the ideology that's basically at the core of programming too, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's other things. Okay, there's other things that are going on, um, you know, as well. So I, I see we have to wrap up. So that's probably a bigger conversation, but those are great. Is there anything either of you would like to add just to kind of end the, the discussion um, for the day? It's been amazing. It's, yeah, it's uh, been uh, fantastic. You know. Thanks so much, Loretta. This and the, the, everything you guys are doing over at IM4 Lab is so, so fascinating and interesting and, and really important. I think is actually kind of goes to just creating spaces where I think people can come and feel comfortable asking questions and saying like, I don't know. I, I think that that's, that's really exciting is to kind of be creating that space. And I think it's an interesting time too because We've got these emerging technologies that are so brand new that nobody knows how to use them. And so there's no experts. And so having these spaces where we can be kind of learning these emerging technologies, like right as they're coming out and helping shape what, what they can do and how they're used is, is so valuable. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I, and of course, again, we're, we're always inspired by the work that you do and work that people are doing at AppTech and all the other um, sites of, of this um, experimenting and playing and you know taking seriously these technologies. And Nancy, was there something, any other things you would like to add? I just wanted to thank um, IM4 for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, and you know, this it's it's really amazing. Like, you know, I did the I was able to do my workshop last Friday and just interacting with the students and you know, we were just doing coding HTML like one line one line at a time, but you know, it's, it was amazing that we were able to create like a VR, a web VR environment within four hours of time um, when no one had any experience uh, working in that um, web app. And it was just amazing to see how quickly people can learn technical skills. So, so yeah, it, it was just, it made me, it made me feel very um, full and um, I just feel like this entire journey with I am for uh, with the last talk last Wednesday and the workshop for the talk today has been like an incredible um, uh, growth uh, journey for me myself as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's well. I mean, I think that's you know one of the reasons I created well, I am for obviously, but also I mean when you look at Indigenous science, Indigenous science is full of innovation. We're we're, we're always innovating, and we were in, innovating with what was around us. Like what were the, you know, birch bark and we could create this, you know, amazing, one of some of the most amazing, uh, w you know, water vessels in the world, you know, um, you know, the, the, um, the canoes from the West Coast here and, you know, people that live here, what, these you know, ocean going canoes. I mean, it's innovation, you know, it, is, uh, is who we are. I mean, and innovating within an ethical way, innovating with with technology that is respectful of the ancestors, respectful of the of the animals and, and the, the, the plants that give their life that, so that we can, can create the technology. Um, I think those are all sort of principles that we can live with and bring and bring into the work that we do. So um, yeah, we feel very honored that you were part of these uh, today. We're really looking forward to Nyla's workshop. I'm actually gonna try to take that one. I've been mean, taking, um, um, but I, I'm gonna do all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, yeah, um, and, yeah, and so yeah. it's at it's eleven I, or sorry ten o'clock in Vancouver time one one o'clock here in Toronto. I think it's a, it's at eleven or noon. I can't. Remember. Yeah. I okay. So one, that would be one o'clock here. One o'clock. Yeah. One o'clock Toronto. One o'clock Toronto. So that's ten o'clock here. Yes. Cool. All right. So we're just about ready to to uh, say our farewells, and so take care and our you know our respect to both of you and. Um, Respect to all the good people. I just remembered uh, Quinn Manders last his name. He's one of our instructors, but I'm sure there's others I left out. And the interns, Samuel, Sam, Pamela, Tierra, Julian, and they're missing and rain burning. 
So thank you to our new interns because they've been rocking it as well. And we're going to turn it over to the DJ and there'll be some other information that will come up that will also give people more information about uh, Nala's workshop. And thanks so much again, everybody, for, for being here with us and, and uh, sharing this time with us and uh, respect to all of you and uh, all, all the, the people who you, you love and who you share knowledge with. Hi, hi. Okay. DJ Blackfoot, thank you so much for having me. Check us out on Instagram at Drumbeat Entertainment and on Facebook at the same name. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, DJ Blackfoot. <laughs>